You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. And welcome to Spookulative Evolution. Hello, David. I was curious. <laughs> and hello, listeners. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our third entry into the Spookulative Evolution mini series. So, I'm excited. Oh, I, this one's going to be a fun one. I've been looking forward to this one. Today we are talking about fish people. But before we get into that, since you've already read the title, you knew that, let's remind everyone what this series is. This is our Spook E, or Spookulative Evolution, mini series for October, where we are going through some of our favorite and some of the classics and potentially in the future weirder ones. But monsters, creatures, critters, myths, legends etc, cetera, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, and taking a look at their anatomy and their traits and figuring out or coming up with ideas for how these creatures may have potentially evolved or how you could get something very similar to them through actual evolutionary processes or biological features. Yes, speculative evolution with an october twist. Absolutely. And today, we're talking about fish people. Fish people. Inspired, since we, I wanted this first month to be classic monsters, decided to use one of the classic movie monsters, the creature from the Black Lagoon, to steer this next episode. And for any of you who are unaware, the creature from the Black Lagoon, which is definitely one of the first fish people things, definitely in movies is a movie released by Universal Pictures, released in 1954, so back a little ways. Same year as Godzilla. Yes, it is. So heyday for movies, for movie monsters. Good year. And this is basically the concept that there is an ancient, primeval, fish human creature lurking in the waters of the Amazon. And it is not the only fish-human creature, humanoid fish you know, person, fish, fish monster. Fish people. Fish people. This is not the only one in movies. We've actually seen a bunch recently. Uh, Abe Sapien from Hellboy is yes. a basically sophisticated <laughs> version of the creature by the fans known as Gilman. So everyone knows the creature of the Black Lagoon is actually Gilman. Oh, I did not know that. That's what the, the costumed character was named as on the set and what all the fans know that monster as. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Right? And so Gilman is part of a long line of fishy people. Like we said, Abe Sapien, more recently than that, Shape of Water, which is kind of like an in-between of Abe Sapien and Gilman. Not mm -hmm. as sophisticated, but a good guy. So the idea of fish people has definitely popped up in human stories, but probably one of the oldest well-known ones is actually going to be H.B. Lovecraft and his Deep Ones, a race of humanoid fish people living in ancient mysterious cities below the seas that come up and actually creature of the black lagoon has a creepy scene where he obsesses over a human female these fish people actually breed with people to create weird hybrids that slowly turn into fish people it's really disturbing because it's hb lovecraft yeah thanks lovecraft yep but it, they show up prominently and i believe the first time they really are mentioned in his stories is in uh the shadow over Innsmouth. And it's a story very much about a, a town that's been controlled and overwhelmed by these fish people and is now cut off from society so that they are not found out. Huh. So fish people have been in our stories for quite a while. Very similar to when we talked about mermaids, our first yeah. speculative endeavor. There's also a bunch of fish people-y type things in Aquaman comic lore. Absolutely. And so there very well might be some... The, uh, that there's a, a race in Aquaman comic lore called the Trench. Yes. Which are basically fish people. And they, I, I think there are rumors that they might show up in the Aquaman movie later this year. So there may be yet more fish people. I, I, I feel like I saw them in one of the trailers. Or I saw something that... Uh, yeah, maybe. Definitely should be them if it's not. But fish people are popular and they tend to share some key traits and so that's kind of what we're going to look at today we don't have one single creature because it's more of an idea of mm -hmm. an aquatic humanoid but not the mermaid route a fish skin like an alternate video game skin applied to a human 
Yeah, well, and they're amphibious. They're amphibious. So whereas mermaids are very much, you you cannot survive on land because you have a dolphin tail. Mm -hmm. Fish people, right? The creature from the Black Lagoon. Also, we should mention, Will and I, in prep for this discussion, yes. went and watched the creature from the Black Lagoon <laughs> so that we have a particular fish person image in our heads well uh, but it's got legs it walks on it land and it's got the webbed feet you know so it's doing both that's kind of the the mentality behind a lot of these fish people stories is the the sea invading the land the mist you know the sea's always been a source of mystery for human stories it's where we don't know what's down there it's deeper than our mountains are tall we can't mm -hmm. breathe under there once you go down to certain depth you can't even see down there so it's it's nothing but mystery. That's why we've talked about monsters existing in it since we've been aware of it. This fish person idea is kind of it coming to get us. You know, that's very much the vibe given in the H.P. Lovecraft stuff is that there are things down there that if you only knew, you would be maddened once you were aware of them. And they are now coming to get you. So yeah. they are able to come on land you are not safe on the boat you are not safe in the camp if you're near the water they can come get you it's kind of the mentality in all these stories and the features they exhibit is they're typically you know human sized you know average six seven feet usually they're powerful like they don't they're usually very strong they usually have claws and mm. within those clawed fingers they also have webbing on their fingers and toes naturally as well as fins across the body which is always the part that interests me and we can talk about that in more detail but they typically have a dorsal spine fin some of them have it on the head some of them have it on the backs of the arms and the backs of the legs just fins around and then they also have gills typically now they are amphibious and this is something we're going to have to talk about cuz they typically have gills usually either on the face or on the neck so somewhere mm -hmm. around the head but Official Gilman lore is that it also had backup lungs in case it was ever not able to use its gills. Interesting. So it has both. And there are animals that show this, which we'll get into, but that's it is not that it is breathing air and water the same way, which is typically how mermaids are shown, that they just are a person, and they come up, and they talk to you, and then they go down, and they talk to each other. Yeah. This one has gills on the outside and lungs on the inside. Very much fishy features mm -hmm. on a humanoid shape absolutely scales and webs and fins i always appreciated abe sapien because they gave him a breather for when he came out of the water yep that always made me happy <laughs> that they suggested that he could be okay without it for a while but he does not actually breathe in air very well which i like uh so that's basically the mentality here uh, you also get other monstery features with some of them, like the creature of the Black Lagoon survives gunshots and survives oh, yeah. being poisoned, and they have a healing factor, and like there's many of them that have actual magic. So once again, magic disclaimer, we, we are not going to be able to explain the magic, but fishy parts are things we can talk about. And I think that it's interesting that they tend to exhibit super strength and stuff like that. Yes. And I feel like that's probably just one of those monsterification things. It's, yeah, it's... That it's got to have super strength. Otherwise, it's not scary. Well, it's the same reason that that's the most mundane superhero power. Yes. It, it is always a little more interesting if you can list stuff you wouldn't normally be able to lift. Yes. And so, yeah, it's, I think that's just a... a run-of-the-mill monsterification going on there but since we had described it as fish features applied to a human i thought it makes sense to start with a human or some mammalian form if we mm -hmm. could find a fishy alternative in creature of the black lagoon they suggest that this is supposed to be some sort of transitional creature from sea to land yes like that it's an evolutionary uh um they call it an evolutionary dead end. Dead end. That's what it was. I was trying to remember how they referred to that it. it. They actually say that it... Oh, well, because they, they described the lungfish this way. That yes, it they did. tried to evolve out of the ocean and failed. Mm-hmm. And now it's Which, caught between worlds. And we don't have to go into this right now, <laughs> but just the, just the caveat for all of our listeners, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. But to start, it sounds like you want at least for now, to to try to go the opposite way. Yeah. Can, How do we get 
a human or something uh, like us. Yeah, it, it, H.P. Issue. Lovecraft idea. You know, could a human, you know, or a, a humanoid develop through evolution fishy features? And we talked a little bit about this with mermaids. And I don't think this will be the one we stay on for very long because I feel like we're going to hit some roadblocks pretty soon. But yep, <laughs> it's definitely, especially since they are obviously humanoid in shape. You know. Yes. We, we already. Almost like a guy in a suit. Almost. Almost. So I think most of the features are pretty easy. Like scales are not. We already talked about that with mermaids. Scales and fins and webbing are not difficult to picture on a mammal. You yes. have scaly mammals like armadillos and pangolins. You have, you know, you could definitely get fins. They'd probably be more like flippers. But, you know, right. dolphins have fins. Dolphins have flippers. So that's not ridiculous. You have web hands and feet for a lot of aquatic mammals like seals and you know s- little swimming um uh, like muskrats and stuff so yeah. all of that's pretty reasonable claws are run of the mill for mammals we're the ones that do it the best uh, next to reptiles mm-hmm. so claws are easy the one that we obviously run into is gills yeah i think if you're trying to turn a terrestrial group like humans mm-hmm. or primates into a fish person yeah now it, what this is actually a really nice one unlike the spookies we've done so far in that this has happened many yes. many times there are absolutely we have lots of examples of secondarily aquatic terrestrial animals yes so something that's half in and half out i'm thinking like an otter yeah still good on land good in the water it's got the webbed feet and it's got the streamlined body it's it, also very monstery. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> they're they're horrifying. <laughs> so it's easy to imagine that selective mm-hmm. pressure. So, okay, webbed feet, sure. Maybe some external characters that turn into fin-like structures. Yeah. That, that give you a little bit of maneuverability. Yeah, sure. Gills. Gills are a big, big gap to breach. Yeah, otters don't have gills. They don't have gills. Dolphins and whales don't have gills. Seals and sea lions don't have gills. To my knowledge, gills, I believe gills sh- most likely have a single evolutionary origin, mm-hmm. have not evolved more than once. No, At least not been... fish-like gills that we're, that we're going for here. So that one's pretty difficult. Also, I want to put out there that even though they're aesthetically pleasing, all the fins on the back of the arms and the legs, I've always found those really funny. Because they look cool. I get it. I, yeah, yeah. I understand why you put them there. But what are they doing? I was going to say that. That you've got the fin. So you picture a fish mm-hmm. with the fins, the dorsal fins, the, like a sailfish. Classic. Yep. Yep. Or a crocodilian has those scutes mm-hmm. up and down the back that give you that little raised area. And that's great when you swim side to side. Yep. But, like, but we don't. And and like, what? It, how are some fins on the back of your arms helping are they adding to the paddle ness like what about on the back of the shins those that's always the ones that are weird to me like, <laughs> like aquaman with the yeah, like the, the fins those little the, the calves. those little fins on the calves like those aren't even like if we're kicking our legs up and down those aren't even helping you paddle those are just extra stuff there <laughs> so it's the i don't think even if you got an aquatic person who was as close to being a fish person as possible, they wouldn't have fins and just aesthetically over the body like that. I like to imagine, actually, because mammals tend to swim up and down. Yes. You, that's why dolphin tails are flat up and down, and shark fins, shark tails are vertical. Mm-hmm. So if a humanoid creature developed fins and swam in that up and down pattern we would more likely have them between our arms and legs. Yep. Like a flying squirrel. Mm-hmm. That would be helpful. Yeah. I could also picture them being on the outsides of the legs, like like cowboy pants, like just sticking yes, off the like side like bell that bottoms. Way. Like bell bottoms, and it's just expanding your paddle yes. for you to swim with. So yeah, that one's an interesting one. I, I cannot think of a really good way. I mean... There's some things that might be able to be co-opted for a mammal to be able to breathe underwater, but it'd be a real stretch for how we function. It would. I, I, I think that there are some land-dwelling animals that have uh, skin breathing. Yes, and we'll get to those because they, they definitely, there's been some 
alternative answers to gills, but yeah, there are amphibians that breathe through their mm-hmm. skins. Turtles breathe through their butts. They very do. famously. So there. So that might be the way we have to do it. We might have that. Listen, do you want to go? Hey, you want to be a fish person? You want to be a fish person? Sacrifices have to be made. This is the price you pay. You got to breathe through your butt. <laughs> Start practicing now. <laughs> At the aquarium, I call it a reverse fart. <laughs> <laughs> That's listen. We we pride ourselves in bringing our listeners quality content. <laughs> that was reverse fart by Will Harris. <laughs> the kids love it on the tours. <laughs> so going backwards is difficult. So going from fish to bipedal fish. Mm-hmm. is the next thing to kind of look into. H- how could that happen? What fish are closest? And what the other big question here, and I know this isn't necessarily the whole point, of it, but like, what would it be practical? I always think about that with yeah. us making bipedal versions of everything. It's like, I, I think that's only good for what we're doing. And and that's definitely comes up in your speculative evolution because part of what i like the way you describe our speculative evolution discussions including if this happened what would it actually more Mm -hmm. likely look like because yeah in order to make it a functional evolutionary trait you need to take that into account yes if you just make it to look the right way it's not going to survive that's what happens to designer bred animals is Yes. We made them look one way, and usually they have many health issues if they're if those aren't addressed during the breeding. I guess we should point out that evolving fish into a bipedal terrestrial creature yes. has happened. Yes, I, I do believe I've read about this. It, that's, a, that's a thing that has occurred. Now, it took <laughs> quite a long time. Yes, yes it did. And, and we by, left behind a lot of the fishy parts. Yep, and by the time we got to... now. But the reason that we did, of course, is that we, our ancestry was fully terrestrial Mm -hmm. for tens of millions of years before we became bipedal. Yes. So this would be more like if you took the fish, you know, Devonian age into the Carboniferous, the first movements onto land, those sort of temnospondyl, big amphibian creatures, what if those then had an impetus to be bipedal. Absolutely. Which is actually what sparked one of the inspirations for doing this episode is when we asked for ideas for our spooky series. One of them was frogs evolving creature of the Black Lagoon style. Oh. And that's the one that I think has the most benefit is absolutely what you're saying. Taking at the transition, at the amphibian level, where things are already half and half. You know, right. most amphibians have gills when they are tadpoles. Yep. So they most of them lose those gills. Not all do, but most do, and then develop lungs. But if you could get something somewhere in that transition period where you had more of a lungfish situation going, or a uh, the bickiers mm-hmm. are also fish that have gills and lungs. Yes. And basically, the lung um, in these fish is a specialized swim bladder that has been made more efficient at absorbing oxygen while it's car- while it's holding air. Uh, the lungfish actually has multiple like sections and chambers within it. So it's a functioning true lung. But, and I didn't know this until I was looking it up, most lungfish can't actually use their gills because they've atrophied. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's only the Australian lungfish that can still use both. So, ah. yeah. So you can get a creature... and. It's easy to see the selective advantage here to have gills for water breathing, lungs for air breathing, Mm -hmm. to have both and be able to do both. Yes. Now, if we go amphibian-y, many adult amphibians today, sometimes you get those fishy gills, and Gill Man has those. They're big slits on the back of the skull. Yes, absolutely. And you can actually watch them breathe in and out, you know, move and pump water. Yep. Some of them, like the axolotl, Mm -hmm. have those frilly patches of gills on the sides of their heads. Yeah, the external gills on on little tendrils. Which, not saying we have to do that, (laughs) but it's an option, and it would make our fish person look cool. It would be very cool looking. The other (laughs) thing that that some amphibians do 
the hairy frog has an another option for getting oxygen while you're in the water because we talked about skin breathing. Uh, amphibians have a semi-permeable skin in that they can exchange gases through the skin. So they exhale through the skin and can inhale through the skin more than most animals, more mm -hmm. than most uh, land animals for sure. Well, some amphibians have specialized skin adaptations where they either have lots of folds or, like the hairy frog, as its name suggests, gets all of these little things called paplia that are basically little fleshy hairs that stick off the body, increasing surface area, and it's thought the main purpose is to allow them to stay underwater longer, exchanging oxygen more efficiently. And the males develop this while they're guarding the eggs and staying underwater as a, a, a nest guard for long periods of time. Interesting. You know what I like about that? is it also provides an excuse to have weird ornamentation yeah. on our fish person. We were talking about those fins being functionally useless. If all you need to do is increase surface area, you can excuse all sorts of crazy structures on oh, the yeah. arms, on the back, on the head. Well, and if you went with hair, you could actually have a... a you could have an ex aesthetically amphibian-ish fish transition humanoid that has hair in a beard or hair in sideburns that is for that are basically like dreadlocks that are fleshy dreadlocks like yeah. the predator for exchanging oxygen while they're in the water also I, and and we're talking now about yeah you because know, i've been thinking that we we said you can have gills and lungs and then we went on to continue suggesting other options mm -hmm. i do wonder how much oxygen intake it takes to sustain a body the size of a person exactly that's a very very good question so you might it might be good to have multiple forms mm -hmm. of oxygen intake in this creature having extra one especially if you're being active yes because most of the animals that most of the vertebrates that are breathing underwater are not active while they're doing so Turtles mm -hmm. do not swim around while they're butt breathing. No. And frogs do not chase food while they're skin breathing because you're only getting a little bit of oxygen. Gills are the best way yes. to breathe underwater and be active. The OG. So it, it would almost certainly have to have true gills, but it definitely could have functioning lungs. So even though that sounds like a, a silly double up that the movie made up, that's completely possible. Oh, absolutely. Now, the fun part comes in, because this is one thing that I I've immediately thought of when I was thinking of how do you get fish or amphibians to match the monsters? On, on the mammal side, it was gills was the big barrier mm -hmm. for and reptiles as well, for that matter. But for amphibians and fish, the main barrier that I come across is claws. Interesting. Because you don't see that popping up in almost any of those groups, except for a couple which I have, I have listed. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> One of them named the African clawed frog. Uh, aptly oh, it sounds, so. sounds like it's going to fit. That sounds exactly the frog we want. It's the frog we're looking for. But also, the hairy frog comes in again. Oh. They both have claws, and in different ways, and they're fantastic. So, African clawed frogs have, on their back feet, their first three toes have true claws. Interesting. Which is... Very unusual for amphibians. It's only them and one other group of frogs have true claws, same as a mammal or reptile's claw. So true claws in this case being a keratinized, mm -hmm. a like a nail. Like a fingernail. Attached to the last digit, the last bone in, the, in, in each digit, mm -hmm. sticking off for the purposes of getting traction or, or yes. latching onto things. Absolutely. So you have your last bone with a sheath, very much like a horn sheath on cows, mm -hmm. a sheath over that bone that makes your claw. There are other frogs that have like keratin or tough bits on the tips of their toes on the outside of the skin. These frogs have true claws, which is cool. And they use it for climbing. And I saw some things describe them as using it for tearing up their food, but I couldn't find anything that confirmed that. And I think it was actually confusing where the claws were because the claws are on the back feet not the front feet so i don't think they actually do that interesting but i read it like in two or three different places so 
you you'd probably read that if you looked it up Mm -hmm. but the hairy frog is the one that i want to go with just because it's cooler now i this might be the one i'm thinking i think it is go ahead (laughs) so true claws have keratin nails over the bone the hairy frog said i don't need any keratin what they have is a specialized end digit bone in their back feet again Mm -hmm. that is curved and sharp but still within the skin of the toes so you wouldn't see it from the outside you would not be able to see it and it would not be exposed or doing anything until the frogs flex a very specific muscle that bends that bone downward and actually breaks it away from another piece of bone that caps it off so it actually has to break off a little collagen connector to do this and then that sharp bit of bone punctures the outside of the frog's toes to come out as semi-retractable claws. So Wolverine. So Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems that they do this as a defense mechanism. When they get stressed, they flex those toes and they start kicking and slashing to get away. And it's on those big back feet. Now, the researchers don't know... If they can retract or what happens when they do, they suspect that they'd probably be able to heal because amphibians are good at that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, retractable wolverine claws. And I like to think that you, both of those give really good uh, examples of how you could get that evolving. Why Mm -hmm. would you get that? The impetus for claws is pretty straightforward. You forgetting traction. If you're crawling up out of the, out of the water, uh, you, cause in the creature from the black lagoon, it's always shown reaching its hand up out of the water. <laughs> yes. Claws will be great for pulling yourself up mm-hmm. as a defense mechanism. Uh, I would add to the list, and this is very speculative because I don't know if this is a thing that has ever happened. <laughs> but I would wonder if you could modify scales. Yeah. Because one thing that we have not kept in this discussion is that most amphibians as we know them are not scaly. Yeah. So in our scenario, if we want a scaly fish person, they will have retained the scales for some reason, Mm -hmm. but perhaps for protection or perhaps, I guess I don't know why amphibians would have lost their scales. That's, I was actually just thinking that I don't know if, if there's a hypothesis as to why amphibians did away with their scales. Uh, And I've always seen it displayed that things like Timnospondyles were scaleless, but I don't know when scales went away. Yeah, and the scales eventually came back. Reptiles have evolved scales, mammals have evolved scales. But I wonder if you could do... I'm I'm imagining, like, Dunkleosteus, who we talked about in episode 29, had Mm -hmm. the armor plating over its face. Yes. And they came down into sharp projections in front of the jaws. Instead of teeth, it used its armor. Yes, so I'm imagining that but with scales and claws. Mm-hmm. Where would that, and, and then it would just look like a gauntlet. It would just look like you were like a glove yes. of scale over it. <laughs> and so looked this... like fingernail extensions that went <laughs> all the way up the finger. <laughs> Only half as terrifying. Yes. <laughs> uh, when someone comes up to touch your animal at the aquarium with ex- and nail extensions, it's the most nerve-wracking thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but... It, it, the thing I really like about this is to get this combination of features, you have to have fish evolving to an amphibian-esque creature, but keeping scale. So this would have to be a branch that broke off a, somewhere a lo- you know, around the time of Tiktaalik, the first tetrapod. Yes. And instead of going the amphibian route, went a scaly amphibian route. Yes. And kept the gills, which is not... A ridiculous idea it basically be like a lungfish that continued to be a lungfish while also taking advantage of the land yes you know or a bit the big ears are fish that do this as well and they're really the ones that we should look at they're just not as well known because they actually can walk not well are but they're the ones, ones that, that lose their little front limbs and yeah, their, yeah, yeah. their it... pectoral girdle strengthen when they left them on land yeah, they walk with their with their front limbs. And so they, they flop their body and they use their front fins to hold and pivot and then hold and pivot while they do their fishy back and forth. Yes. And 
they really are the ones that are probably the ideal. They have they have functioning gills, so they are perfectly capable underwater, and they have functioning lungs, just not quite as advanced as the lung fishes. They are more mobile on land, and if they just kind of like a mud skipper kind of, but with with this lung route, just started developing claws of some sort. All you'd have to get it to do is stand up. And that's what I've been now trying to think of is it is a vi- long arms and long legs on a bipedal body is very weird. Yes, it is. That has been done once. Mm-hmm. We are a very strange shape. So now I'm trying to think of what circumstances might lend to turning our fish thing, our scaly, clawed, mm-hmm. lung slash gill fish creature into a humanoid shape the the first idea i have is often an idea that comes up we've mentioned it before is the the bear scenario where this is a quadruped a four-legged walker that can raise up Mm -hmm. and walk around and if any of you saw um pedal the news about pedal the walking black bear that's in new jersey uh there's news that's come out recently because it's a black bear that Injured its front limbs. It's it's missing a portion of, I believe, the right arm. Okay. And its left is injured. So it has had to, to get around, walk on the back legs, and then it will go down on all fours, kind of hunching on those front limbs to, like, sniff around and eat. When it walks around, it walks like a person. <laughs> like, eerily so. Well, once you have no tail mm-hmm. and you're, you have to walk on two legs, I, I assume there's only so many ways to pull that off. Yeah, and so it makes me wonder if maybe, like, what if it it took a froggy form and it was getting long legs and stuff and using claws to pounce and hunt very much like frogs do. Mm -hmm. They use their jumps to catch food, but now it's grabbing with claws instead of just little fleshy frog toes and has the ability to do a raise up, kind of like monitor lizards do to combat or something. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe it's not completely upright. It's more froggy hunched, but it can... It can adjust its ankles or hips like crocodilians do to go from low walk to high walk. And it can, you know, maybe it does a basilisk thing to run away from predators and that becomes a, I can raise up. You know, maybe it's not always that way, but it's a momentary thing. Well, and then we've talked about the nice thing about bipedalism is you've freed up your front arms. Yes. And now you have selective advantage to using those. It could be like a kangaroo with its claws out. Yes. It raises up and then it has those claws ready to defend itself or fight a rival. Now, I was going a, a slightly different direction. Interesting. With my thought, because I was thinking that the human body shape is a really bad shape for swimming. Yes, it is. It really, really, really is. So what if our creature has that shape because its ancestry was not very swimmy? Shallows and stuff. Shallows, mm-hmm. calm water... And then I'm starting to think, well, our ancestors evolved this shape, primates, to move around in treetops. What if this was a thing that evolved to climb around in kelp forests? Oh, or maybe like mangroves. Or like mangroves. It was, a, it was a mangrove dweller, and it could actually climb up into the branches to go after prey up in the... You know, look for nests and stuff. Yeah, what if this was an amphibious, not amphibian primate... But it evolved to use all four limbs to get around in a very similar way. Yeah, cause, well, like um, like monkey frogs. Yes. Like like if you've ever watched, if guys go look up a monkey frog, they walk with their hand over hand and foot over foot, and they grab onto branches with their little froggy pad feet, yep. just like a monkey does. It looks exactly like a, a macaque ro- going across a power line. And that... Now you have not only an advantage for long, dexterous limbs, but you have excused the fact that you're terrible at swimming compared Mm -hmm. to your fishy ancestry. So this could be, and it's not a huge stretch to get a frog shape into the frogs are already shockingly human shaped. Yes, they really are. They've got abs, people. (laughs) Same, Same place we have abs. That was the first thing I noticed when I dissected a frog is they have a six pack. Just like we would. And those long back (laughs) legs and those grabby front arms. 
So maybe you start out that way, you get yeah. that shape. And then any of those other explanations for bipedalism, for walking, if you get well, larger. That's exactly what I was going to say. Maybe just getting big is all it takes. Kind of like the idea with ostriches and terror birds that you you get a very similar shape if you're going to be a big bird. Well, and if you're large, maybe you started out climbing around. Mm -hmm. You all got your kind of and primate -y shape. Gollum-y. Gollum yes, very gollum -y. But if if there's selective pressure to get larger, mm -hmm. larger might mean less time in the trees. It might mean less yeah. time in the kelp forest or whatever. So now very much, and I'm obviously stealing this from human evolution. Yes. But it's a, it's a, a convergent evolution. Yeah. So now you're large and now you have a benefit to walking around on land. Your hands are freed. You've got these dexterous clawed hands webbed still. Mm-hmm. So perhaps now you have your true walking around fish monster, except that I imagine the arms and legs would be much more gangly. Oh, yeah, yeah, much more lanky. Yeah. It, it'd, be, it'd be probably way creepier looking because it's not going to be beefy with a fish shape. It's going to be like spindly and... and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that brings up... And I, I'm glad that I remember this. You were talking earlier about it. Ha it would have had to have split off mm -hmm. before uh, tetrapods as we know them. Yes. Which makes me wonder what the bones and the limbs would come out looking like. Oh, right. Like Because if you branched off before the limbs were fully developed, you might get a different arrangement in the arms. Mm -hmm. Early tetrapods came with a whole variety of numbers of fingers. I was about to say, it could have <laughs> way more than it just five fingers and toes. Nine fingers and toes on each oh. hand and foot. <laughs> this... If listen, if this is joining, and I'm gonna take a yes, it, yes, someone on Twitter, yes, they Brian did. Brian on Twitter called this this the common descent spooky cryptid verse, which is which is all we can think about now. That's what it, that <laughs> is the official name. <laughs> yes, it is of our menagerie. If this creature is in our spooky cryptid verse, it has too many fingers. It too many. <laughs> I'm no. making the executive decision. Oh, well, because if we're trying to evolve something spooky then yeah, absolutely, yes. it should have too many fingers and it has got well, claws on them and webs. If any of you ever take a chance to look at the, the queen alien hand from the alien movies, it hers has that where it's like very normal fingers and then it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller down until there's like eight digits. And there were early tetrapods mm -hmm. that had a very similar setup. And that would be much better for swimming. You give a much better paddle shape with that. Yep. I'm also wondering if uh, I'm thinking about, so uh, a little while ago, we did archaeology day at the museum, and I learned how to use an atlatl. Yeah. And an atlatl is a spear thrower. It's a Native American spear thrower. And basically what it is, is a little bar shaped item you hold. You notch the spear on it. It's got a little hook on the end. Yep. And you flick it and it throws the spear and what it does is it adds an extra lever. Mm -hmm. So instead of having your upper arm from shoulder to elbow and then your lower arm from elbow to wrist, you've added an extra length. So when you flick your arm, you're bending in three places and it gives yes. you that much more power. I, how many joints does this thing have if it's got to power itself? Yeah, who knows? Like the only reason we have our one bone, two bones, eight bones five digits mm -hmm. is because that's what one of our ancestors stumbled upon and happened to give rise to the rest of us. Yeah, that was the only option we had. This thing could have all sorts of crazy arm and leg shapes. It could be, yeah, I mean, it could have multi-jointed arms. It could have multiple digits. Yeah, it could be real, real weird. Who knows how its shoulders get constructed? Oh, yeah, like, and its pelvis. Mm-hmm. If it, if it walks like a frog instead of like a person. Are its mm -hmm. legs splayed out to the side a little more? You could, it yeah. could be all sorts of different things. And it just like, now it could have this thing where it's like all creepy and then Panther pounces on you from eight feet away. Yes. Like just launching <laughs> itself with these long legs. Uh, one thing that I think it should definitely still have, and I don't know how you speculative put this in here, but Gilman mm -hmm. has a very fishy face. Yes, he does. And it's constantly doing that. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. mouth thing 
Mm-hmm. That that fish mouth, the baby fish mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's super creepy and weird. Yep. It's 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 oh, and, and for fish, that's how they pump water over the gills. Is they have to keep opening the mouth and moving the water to do that. Uh, when you see them doing that, most fish have the um operculum. Operculum. Thank you. Uh, I my brain was stuck on spiracle. So I, by the way, listeners, just to show, you, Will, <laughs> on the Skype I'm, call here. Held I his hands, hands up on either side of his head. That's how I knew what he was trying to get at. <laughs> <laughs> I was making my operculums. Yes. <laughs> and they can use those to pump. So fin, you know, ray fin fish and bony fish, carps and salmon and barracuda, all the typical scaly fish you think about, have operculum that they can pump with. Sharks and other fish that don't have that have to... <gasps> Pull in water with their mouth. Gulping. Or they have holes on the side of their head called spiracles to pull water in over the gills that pump Ooh. water there. So who knows? Our guy could have spiracles and have little water siphons in the side of its head that it that constantly go. Because that's what they do when they leave the water, just in case you didn't know. When a stingray <laughs> sticks its head up, it goes. <laughs> that sh- and that could be one of my favorite tropes in horror is the noise the foreboding noise mm-hmm. and my favorite example of this is not a horror movie at all but an episode of invader zim <laughs> where the cooing, the cooing, yeah, the where cooing. it's the pigeon noise and you hear and you go oh, it's nearby i so this creature that's how you know is you're in you're in the yeah. you're in the lagoon and you hear i just took a drink from my water bottle and so <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, could little... even if it's echoey it could go <laughs> it's a cave dweller yes <laughs> <gasps> yeah so we we have an alternate evolutionary path for tetrapods that stayed more linked to the water and keeping more of their fishy traits to become a equally comfortable on land and water so probably living in marshes and you know, mangroves and swamps or kelp forests where they are able to find food equally in both spots Mm -hmm. that were able to develop either cloths from keratin bones protruding, or I like the scale idea as well. Uh, I really, though, the claws poking through the bones poking through the skin, that's just wonderful. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, let's it can have that, too. It can have one, like a. It's <laughs> yes. like the the grooming claw yes. or the uh, what is it? The eye eyes. Yeah, yeah. That have their tappy claw. There you oh. go. I mean, best of it's, all worlds. I just have my movie image picture where it's doing the creature of the back lagoon slow reach towards something, and then all of a sudden claws exposed from the fingertips, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> just push through as it gets closer. So it looks Ugh. less foreboding and just slimy, and all of a sudden there are daggers. Yeah. I like what we've made. I, yeah, we have <laughs> we have created a monster, <laughs> and I like it. Yes. So there, there's the next member of the lineup, and <laughs> we've got shrew vampires, shrew vampires, baboon wolves, baboon wolves. Uh, uh, one of our Twitter peoples, Lydia, I believe it was, uh, s- suggested that the because it was a regular cycle. Mm-hmm. That we had talked about the werewolf creature being on a, a cycle suggested it could be the females, and that maybe it was a oh. female dominated. Yeah, yeah, like group, hyenas. Like hyenas, yep. So that would make them baboon hyena wolves. I like that too. That, that one that too. one's that one's really cool. And then we have our tectolic descendant amphibian fish people. Yes. <laughs> Our spindly, Ugh, with these these jointy, too mangrove. many fingered. Like this is by far the most alien out of all of them. Oh, I this love is, it so much. We've had to reach farther back in the evolutionary line. This is this one's not even an amniote. Yeah, it would exactly. lay eggs. It could absolutely lay eggs. Oh, oh man! If we're gonna make it creepy, it's got to keep them in its back, like the. the um... <laughs> <laughs> yes, they could pop out among all of its ornamentations. Yeah, it along just the its back. skin swells around there and like big baby pimples. All the little surface area extensions <laughs> on its back could form like a little coral hideout for its babies when they come out. They can live there. And they all pop out and <laughs> start doing their little sucks and sucking noises. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they'd all come out and you'd hear. 
<laughs> just a chorus of. I mean, if if we're gonna monsterify it, like you know, if this ends up in the movie, the babies work like piranhas. Oh, of course they do. <laughs> of course they do. Or well, because they expect <laughs> to have a little burrow hole to live in in the parent. Oh, when they latch onto a person, they obviously dear God try to dig in or go in the mouth or something. It's like the oh, there's a this type is of, just the stuff it just writes itself. There's this type of catfish in the Amazon that does that that burrows into cadavers. It like is a little cigar. Is this shaped. the candy roo? It's similar to candy roo. It's another parasitic, semi parasitic catfish, but it's more like a little sausage. Okay. And it's round and it grabs on and then with a round bites drills into bodies like ooh. Oh, it's great. I love it. Another thing, just to make sure that we we are clear. Most amphibians today have gotten rid of their true teeth. Uh, this one definitely would not have. <laughs> well, I don't know, man. That the gumming with the gulping mouth and and Gilman, I don't think had teeth. They never showed him having teeth. Uh, other ones definitely do. Like Shape of Water definitely yeah. has teeth. The trench do. The trench have those like trench long teeth. Uh, yeah. like viper fish teeth. Mm-hmm. I'm cool either uh, way. Yeah, I, I feel like it could work either way. I'm fine with it. I think you could be as creepy <laughs> either direction. <laughs> Teeth allow them to hunt bigger stuff more easily, take bites out of stuff. This is true. Well, that's... There, there's one left. Yep. Uh, one this... more entry for the month. Stick around for that one. I'm excited for this one as well. I'm going to be excited for all of these guys. This is this is, this is is my dream episodes to be doing, so... <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, I was accused while doing talks at the aquarium of saying too many things were my favorites. Um, but this one uh, is obviously this one is this one is one of my favorites. It's another favorite, <laughs> but not as much. Not as much. <laughs> not as much favorite. If I if I had to pick between vampire <laughs> shrews and fish people, I'd go vampire shrews. But if there's no vampire shrews, it's okay because fish people is favorite anyway. Yeah, it's favorite anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, everyone, <laughs> we will wrap up episode three for this month. So stick around next week. For our final episode of this October, our last spooky delve into the monster world. Yeah, it's just in time for Halloween. Do you, you could let us know if you're going to decide to dress up as any of these. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Listen, we are always, and this is no pressure, but <laughs> fan art and cosplays are always acceptable. Yeah, we, we'll always welcome them. If we, we, <laughs> we support it. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for listening again check in next week and let us know if you have any ideas for the fish amphibian creepy spindly creatures and how they might have evolved in other ways until then sleep well bye bye everyone good night <laughs> need the creaky door <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.